Good morning and a very warm welcome to our online service. In the words of morning prayer from Common Worship, grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Well, we're delighted that you're with us here this morning as we continue our walk through the early chapters of Acts. And uh, this morning we've got as far as Acts chapter 4 and we'll be having a look at the first half of that great chapter together a bit later on. But as we begin our time this morning, we're going to start with an opportunity to come before God uh, and to pray, to say sorry to God and repent of the way in which we've not lived with him as number one in our lives this last week. So if you'd like to do that, please do join in with the words on the screen. As we begin, let us pray. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing our first hymn together now. It's a great hymn that reminds us, as the rest of our service will this morning, that as Christians we have an obligation to speak of the glories of God, indeed to tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Let's sing together. that first hymn is one packed with wonderful words, isn't it? And there's one line there, firm is his promise and his mercy sure. What a great line that reminds us of God's faithfulness to his promise. And as Christians, we can testify to his grace and mercy. We're going to have a little section now called Take Two. And uh, over the coming weeks and months, I've invited different members of the church family to share with us something of their story of how God has been so very good to them. I'm delighted that uh, Deborah Corness has uh, willingly volunteered, yeah we, yeah, we use that phrase, willingly volunteered to uh, participate this week. So uh, in a moment I'll hand over to Deborah and then we'll have our reading and our sermon. Hello, I'm Deborah Cornes, and I'm married to Andrew, who is a chaplain in the Royal Navy, 
and we have two teenage daughters, Rachel and Esther. We've been coming to St Andrew's Church in Buckland for nearly three years now, since our move to Crapstone. I've been fortunate enough to have been brought up in a Christian family and so went to Sunday school from a young age and learnt about the Bible and about Jesus and the stories he told. As I moved into my teenage years, I began to think about more about what this meant to me personally and to begin a walk of faith with Jesus. I've never had a one big revelationary moment or any wonderful healing stories, but what I have had is just gentle teachings and reminders every now and then of what God has meant for me and what it's meant to walk with Jesus. One time in particular came about uh, six or seven years ago when I fell into a metaphorical pit. There was a time when I found it really difficult even to talk to God, but I had some wonderful Christian friends around me from my previous church who stood with me and prayed for me. And I gradually became, had a sense that Jesus was in that pit with me, holding on to me, just like a parent does to a child who is too tired to walk any further. And that image has stayed with me for a while now. And in this time of lockdown, where things haven't always been easily emotionally, I felt that Jesus has been there holding my hand and standing at the edge of what could have been a pit, but has really been a shallow trough. And there's a verse in, found in Psalm 139, I think it's verse five, which says, you hem me in before and behind, your hand is always upon me. And that is something I'd like to share with you. Thank you. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John and, because it was evening, they put him into jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Nobby Stiles, Roy Keane, Joe Coburn, Andrew Neal. Peter Jones, Deborah Meaden. A short list of some of the most feared opposition, past and present. That is, of course, if you are a professional footballer, a politician or a budding entrepreneur. 
back in the 1960s and 1990s, you'd know you're in for a hard afternoon as a professional footballer with hard tackles flying in if you saw Nobby Styles or Roy Keane's name on the team sheet. If you're a politician and uh, brave enough to go on BBC's Politics Live programme, uh, you know you'll be in for a grilling from one of the rather unforgiving hosts like Joe Coburn or Andrew Neil. Or if you're a, a budding businessman looking for some financial firepower behind your latest idea, uh, what better place to go for investment than the BBC's Dragon's Den? Although you'll know dragons like uh, Peter Jones uh, and Deborah Meaden will be waiting to dissect your proposal and to uh, cross-examine your proposed profit margins. Sometimes opposition can be pretty daunting. I wonder how you respond to opposition. Uh, perhaps you like nothing better than a verbal toing and froing with someone else. Or perhaps you're the type of person that will, at all costs, avoid confrontation or opposition. The Bible tells us that as Christians, we should expect opposition. It should be part of life. And not just in terms of uh, archbishops or church leaders, big name evangelists or, or Christians in the public eye. No, all Christians should recognise that opposition is something to be expected, part of daily life. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, the apostle writes this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. Facing opposition is to be expected for the Christian. Perhaps we in the Western world over many generations now have found that's not the case. But let's face it, we are the exception rather than the rule. Throughout history and in many parts of the world right now, Christian face persecution, suffering and opposition on a daily basis. And Peter says, don't be surprised. And Peter knew what he was talking about. As we begin to explore Acts chapter 4 together this morning, the first thing we come across is the reality of opposition. The reality of opposition. If you've got your uh, Bibles open at home, uh, do look with me back at chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John and, because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. As far as the priests and Sadducees were concerned, Peter and John were the wrong teachers, teaching the wrong things in the wrong place. And without a second thought, they had Peter and John thrown into jail. For some of our brothers and sisters in Christ in other parts of the world, this is a familiar story. Last year, the Guardian newspaper ran a story with this headline. In China, they are closing churches, jailing pastors, and even rewriting scripture. The story was, one of, uh, was all about one of the best-known underground churches in China. It had been uh, forced to close down, it had been shuttered up, and uh, the minister, Pastor Wang, his wife and a hundred church members were being held in police custody. Quoting from the article, it says this, Many of those who haven't been detained are in hiding. Others have been sent away from Chengdu and barred from returning. Some, including Wang's mother and his young son, are under close surveillance. Wang and his wife are being charged for inciting subversion, a crime that carries a penalty of up to 15 years in prison. 
Now, although here in our part of the world, things are very different, and at the moment, speaking about Jesus doesn't bring a prison sentence, it's certainly not a very popular thing. It seems that in our modern society, we have lost the ability to discuss differences, to disagree well. All too often, people uh, rush to take offence, shutting down conversations or turning them into shouting matches, whether in person or online. Rather than listening to an alternative point of view, if someone doesn't like what they hear, they're very quick to label it as hate speech. Now, in terms of religion, it's not so much that people have a problem with Christians speaking about Jesus, but they don't like the claim that he is the only way to God. One reason for this is that we live in a society where pluralism is rife. Pluralism is the uh, the belief that uh, there is more than one valid religion and no one religion can claim to have the monopoly on truth. Taking the picture of uh, God being found at the top of some great mountain, uh, pluralism asserts that uh, there are many paths up the mountain. Ultimately, so the claim goes, we will all meet at the top once our respective spiritual journeys are over. They'll all eventually get us to the same place. Therefore, when it comes to religion, the word exclusive is synonymous with bigot. Even worse, Christians who claim and communicate the exclusivity of Christ are often denigrated and dismissed as being blinkered or or simply balmy. The world has no issue with Christians who talk about being good, about trying to live a moral life, about covering over everything with love but the world is keen to keep the exclusive claims of Jesus Christ quiet. That's the reality of opposition. Opposition will come as the truth about Jesus is proclaimed. But did you notice in the verses what else comes? Did you see it there in verse 4? Many who heard believed the message and the number of men grew to about 5,000. It's clear that opposition and belief go hand in hand and yet quite often we forget this or we simply don't appreciate it. We see belief amongst people and it fills our hearts with joy, we're thrilled. But then when opposition comes we are knocked back by it, we're left pretty flat, disenchanted and anxious. And I wonder if we've experienced these things in our homes, our workplaces, here in our parish or or perhaps further afield. Maybe a friend or a relative uh, has shown an interest in talking about spiritual matters. Or you've invited a colleague to come on a Christianity Explore course and they've agreed to do so. But then there are others we know who mock Christianity, who respond aggressively to the church's desire to reach out. Perhaps you have friends and family members who who gently mock your uh, old-fashioned beliefs. Well, if that's the case for you and it leaves you feeling uh, down and disenchanted, then remember Acts chapter 4, verse 4. And remember that in parts of the world where persecution is rife, just like in China, the church is growing and growing and growing as the truth of Jesus is shared. But back to our passage. Did you notice how Peter and John responded when they were called before the officials? I found it really interesting that Peter makes no apologies for what's going on. And even though he's a relatively uneducated man and he's brought up in front of these highly educated religious elite, that is the rulers and the elders and the scribes and the high priest and the high priest's family, he's not daunted. Instead, he speaks with courage and clarity and conviction. Now, none of this should be a surprise to us. You see, in Luke chapter 12, verses 11 to 12, as Jesus is speaking to his disciples, he says this. When you are brought before the synagogue rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. 
And sure enough, verse 8 of our reading, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. And Peter goes on to explain once again that this incredible, miraculous healing is all because of Jesus. But he doesn't stop there. And what he goes on to say is of paramount importance. So um, if you have perhaps mentally drifted away over the last few moments, uh, uh, come back, please refocus, please listen up, because what Peter says next is the most urgent and important thing in the world. Uh, And I'm not overstating it. Look with me at verse 12. Peter says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now that verse is so important, I'm going to read it again. And and please uh, think carefully and ponder these words. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. If you're uh, perhaps visiting our online service for the first time or if you're uh, watching this service and wouldn't consider yourself a Christian, uh, first can I say thank you for joining us. Second can I say please know that this is the heart of the Christian message. We as people are all sinful. We are all in need of a rescue and no amount of good works or religious activity or selfless behaviour can save us, only faith in Jesus Christ. Now I realise that is a massive claim. And can I urge you, please don't just write it off. If you're not sure, please find out more. You can visit our resources page on our website. Have a look at the Christianity Explored link, or the story of God, the world and you. If you'd like to, get in touch with me via the contact page on the website or speak to a Christian friend. Can I say again, there really is nothing in the world more important than this statement. God loves you. God wants to forgive you and offers you eternal life in Christ. If you're asking questions, please don't let this moment pass without speaking to someone, without raising your objections and chatting them through. In Acts chapter 4, it's not necessarily the miracle that causes the problems and the authorities to object to what's going on. It's Peter and John speaking about Jesus. And in verse 3, their first response was to throw these two men into jail. After that, they uh, dragged them before the religious elite for a bit of a grilling. But even then, there's nothing that they can really call against or, or Uh, accuse the apostles of. They can't say it was a fake because, in verse 14, this formerly lame man is standing right beside the apostles. And so they try a new tactic, compromise. You can perhaps in your mind's eye imagine the conversation, the whole uh, good cop play hasn't worked. Uh, uh, Sorry, the bad cop play hasn't worked, throwing them into prison. So they now try the good cop angle. They might have said something like this, guys, we, uh, we really respect you and respect what you've done for this man. We accept that you have different beliefs. But look, we're going we're gonna to go easy on this time. We're going to let you go uh, and no hard feelings. But um, if you could just stop preaching about this Jesus fellow, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Compromise. That's the more subtle reality of opposition. And that's the tact that the opposite, the uh, authorities choose in verses 17 and 18. Again, this attitude might sound familiar to us in our own experience. People might not be actively aggressive in their opposition, but they might insist that we keep our beliefs to ourselves. That we don't share this supposed good news about a supposed saviour, Jesus Christ. But compromise is not an option. Ultimately, our role under God is to share the good news of the gospel and to witness to Jesus. As John C. Richards from Wheaton Bible College in America writes, We need to communicate this truth, 
that we are sinful, whether we know it or not, and are desperately in need of rescue. Our only rescue is found in Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful yet harsh reality. Beautiful because it provides a tangible solution to humankind's biggest issue, the sin that separates us from God. Harsh because it forces us through faith in Jesus to lean on someone else to bring us back into relationship with God. Well, it's that news, that message that will bring about that very real opposition. So how do we respond? Well, that's our second point this morning, the response to opposition. The response to opposition. In the face of opposition, it is, of course, easy just to to back off, to take your foot off the pedal, so to speak. I expect for all of us at uh, one time or another, when we've had a difference of opinion with somebody else, we've decided it's probably best just to stop talking. We can feel ourselves getting rather hot onto the collar and we can see a change in the complexion of the person we're speaking to. And so we think, well, let's just forget it. Let's just leave it at that. When it comes to the gospel, however, it's just too important to dismiss as something that doesn't matter. And that's certainly not what Peter and John did when they faced opposition. Now, let's not forget they've been thrown into jail already. They've been dragged before the religious leaders to explain themselves. And then they've been offered this seemingly easy way out by dialing down and toning down this preaching about Jesus. But in verses 19 and 20, we see their response. Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speak about what we have seen and heard. Similarly, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4, as Paul is speaking about his ministry in Thessalonica, he writes this. We speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but please God. In response to opposition, Peter and John and Paul, for that matter, know exactly who it is there to obey. They cannot deny the wonderful things they have witnessed. They cannot disobey God and stop speaking of Jesus in order to satisfy the whims and the delights of others. No doubt they're aware of God's command to obey authorities and rulers, but not if it meant sinning. No, they know that obeying God is far more important. And it's the same for us today. We, that is Christians, are witnesses to what God has done through Jesus in the revelation of his word and by the work of his spirit. And we are called to share that with others. Now, of course, we're to do that with gentleness and respect. We're not to bludgeon our way in and cause offence by our manner. That's completely counterproductive. But equally, we mustn't pander to the world around us that says, dial down this Jesus stuff. We cannot ignore God's clear command to be witnesses to the wonder of Jesus and to share the whole account of what he has done of what he has said and what he's achieved through the cross. Now, if we're going to be able to do this, we need to focus again on who God is. Peter and John knew that God uh, is the sovereign God and we need to believe that too. It's this that will keep us going in the face of opposition and difficulty. And as well as refocusing on God, it draws us, it it pushes us uh, to be prayerful. We see, uh, we'll see next week, uh, the early church's response to Peter and John's troubles uh, is to pray. Look on to verses 23 to 31 and you can see just that. Well, we need to pray too. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said to his disciples, You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We've seen that commission begin in these early chapters of Acts. And it continues today with us and with believers all around the world. 
speaking about Jesus will bring opposition. But our response is to rely on God, to come to him in prayer, and to unashamedly share the good news of what God has done in Christ. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. As our next song reminds us, it is in Christ alone that my hope is found. Here, in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news that in Jesus we can be saved. Through his death on the cross, we can be forgiven. We can know relationship with you. We can know a future with you. We know that eternal life awaits. Help us to stand firm in that truth and empower us to share with gentleness and respect the good news of the gospel with those around us. Strengthen and help our brothers and sisters in Christ in areas of the world where they are persecuted for their faith. Give them boldness. Give them faithfulness. Help them to keep their eyes fixed on you. And we pray all these things for Jesus' namesake. Amen. We're going to sing our next song in just a moment, but before that, a short video. It's part of a powerful prayer that was delivered in 1976 by Dr. S. M. Lockeridge, entitled That's My King. And the words of this prayer remind us, as does our next song, that it's in Christ alone that our hope is found. Let's enjoy the video and then sing together. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduring strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a well of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous, and his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You see, you can't get him off of your head. 
you can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Tyler couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Hey! We pray for God's grace. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. Lord God, through your grace, we are your people. Through your Son, you have redeemed us. In your Spirit, you have made us your own. We pray for our church. We pray for Andy and Bethany and their family as Andy works under the current restrictions 
to find new ways to minister within our parish. We thank you that we are now able to open our churches for private prayer and devotions, and we look forward to that time when we will be able to meet in person to worship. We pray for St Andrew's School, for the staff, students, parents and governors, as classes return and the new arrangements begin to work. We pray also for the appointment of the new head teacher and the applicants who are applying for the post. Give Andy Farmer and the governors wisdom to steer this process through to the selection of the right person to lead the school forwards. Make our hearts respond to your love. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. We pray for Pastor Huang leading his church in Wuhan at the centre of the COVID-19 outbreak. We thank you that the virus is not stopping his work and we pray for the 50 groups in his church, mostly meeting via the internet. We thank, give thanks that so many Chinese Christians are spending two hours every day to pray, worship, share and testify together. We pray for Chinese pastors who have taken to the internet to stir the church, to rise up and pray for their nation, to pray for the Chinese government and for other countries affected by the virus. We thank you for believers who are on the streets handing out face masks, daily supplies and much needed words of encouragement. We pray that our churches will follow their example, grow stronger through this epidemic and clearly hear God's voice for our nation. We pray for protection from COVID-19 for those living in refugee camps near the northern border with China. Most are Kachin Christians who are displaced. Civilians living around the world in such refugee camps are at high risk if disease spreads mainly due to lack of medical facilities and neglect of public health by their governments. We commit them to your love and protection. Make our lives bear witness to your glory in the world. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. We pray for all of those who are unwell or in any sort of need or distress particularly those who are anxious about their own health or the well-being of someone close to them. We pray also for those whose livelihoods are at risk and are unclear about the future. In a moment of quiet, we pray for those who are known to us and are on our minds. Make our wills eager to obey and our hands ready to heal. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. We give you thanks for opportunities to connect as a church in these times of difficulty. Make our voices one with all of your people in heaven and on earth. Amen. Thank you very much, Paul, for leading us in our prayers. On the subject of prayer, could I remind you that we do have a prayer chain in our churches, uh, a group of volunteers who would be delighted to pray for you or about any needs or concerns that you have at the moment. If you'd like to access the prayer chain, please do get in touch with Margie Goodfellow. Uh, if you don't have Margie's contact details, you can, of course, get in touch with me. Uh, I can either pass on the message or Margie's email to you. Just uh, one or two other notices to draw to your attention before we sing our final song. Uh, the first of which is to say that I'm sure you've seen in the news that churches have now been given permission to reopen. Well, the decision has been made uh, here at Buckland and Milton Coombe to open our churches on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Now, I must stress that that's not to say we'll be hosting services 
or are encouraging groups to meet. Uh, the churches are open for personal and private prayer only. So if you'd find the church building a really helpful venue to uh, stop and reflect, to be quiet and to pray, then uh, please remember the churches will be open on Wednesdays and Saturdays week by week. I am, of course, hopeful that in the coming weeks and months we'll be able to reopen the churches more regularly. And uh, it is our prayer, of course, that in the not too distant future we'll be able to meet again uh, as God's people in our wonderful buildings and enjoy time together. Can I also endorse a couple of books to you? In light of all that we've looked at today, a couple of really helpful biographies. It's uh, really encouraging, isn't it, to hear uh, one another's stories as we've heard from Deborah this morning, uh, but also to think of saints uh, of years gone by. The first book is called A Chance to Die by Elizabeth Elliot and is all about Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael was an Irish missionary who spent uh, 50 plus years out in South India and continued an incredible ministry despite all sorts of different types of opposition. The second book is called uh, Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas and uh, reminds us of the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a man who stayed faithful to Christ through the difficulties of the Second World War uh, and living under Nazi Germany rule. Two great books that I encourage you to uh, pick up and read. Uh, they are quite weighty tomes, uh, so you'll take your, need to take your time working your way through them, but uh, incredibly encouraging and well worth sharing once you've finished reading. Well, in a few moments, I'm going to close us in prayer, but before that, we're going to sing our final song. We've been reminded, haven't we, this morning of all that God has done for us in Christ. And our response? Well, it's to trust and obey. Let's sing together.
I remind you that we uh, meet at 11 o'clock this morning for our virtual Zoom cafe. Do come along with a coffee, a slice of cake, uh, and enjoy a chance to uh, chat and catch up with one another. Something else I forgot to mention in the notices, so apologies. It's a great piece of news, and it's to uh, share with you that Andy Farmer is no longer our curate. Now, don't worry, that doesn't mean that uh, Andy and Debbie are leaving us. Uh, Andy has simply come to the end of his curacy, uh, has completed that, and now becomes our associate minister. So we're very grateful for Andy's ministry and look forward to continuing to partner with him in the gospel in the years ahead. Well, as we come to a close, let's just be quiet for a moment and then I'll lead us uh, and pray for us uh, with a prayer of blessing. So let's pray. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>